Hello, everybody. Hello, comrades. Bienvenue, camarades. Uh, cette célébration du centenaire du PCC. 100 years in the struggle for socialism. We have a wonderful program set for everybody. My name is Dave McKee. I'm a member of the executive of the Communist Party of Canada. And uh, il me fait plaisir de co-animer cette célébration avec ma camarade Fabiola, qui va se, se présenter. Oui, euh, bonjour à toutes et tous. Je suis Fabiola Meya. Je viens d'origine, membre du Parti communiste du Canada, section Québec. Je vais parler en français en alternance avec Dave et Maki, qui le fera en anglais afin de vous présenter les personnes qui rendront possible cette programmation. Et au nom du parti, euh, je vous remercie d'être présent cet après-midi pour euh, commémorer euh, le centenaire euh, du Parti communiste du Canada, et une siècle de lutte euh, à côté euh, de la classe ouvrière et la solidarité internationale. Ben, sans tarder, je vous invite donc à profiter de cet événement très significatif euh, pour le parti. Euh, je veux laisser avec Dave et Maki qui nous dira euh, quelques mots en relation à la reconnaissance euh, au territoire autochtone euh, non cédé. Vas-y, Dave. Merci, Fabiola. So, we would like to begin with a recognition, a land recognition, which will be presented by Tyson Strandland. Thank you, Dave. It is a great honor to be able to speak to you all on this momentous occasion. I am a member of the Métis Nation. And I proudly trace my family tree back to Louis Riel. The lands of Riel's people, however, were the lands around the Red River, part of the east of where I sit just now. Today, I address you from the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples of the Wasonic Nation whose historic connection with these lands is one which continues and remains alive and strong to this day. It must also be acknowledged, however, that this event is taking place across the lands of many Indigenous peoples, and that as Marxist-Leninists, we are committed to carrying their struggles for dignity, justice, and self-determination as our own. As we commemorate today the historic occasion of 100 years of principled struggle, 100 years of the Communist Party of Canada, a cause indeed worthy of great celebration. It is also with heavy hearts that with the recent discovery of the remains of 215 Indigenous children in a mass grave at a Kamloops residential school, that we're once again reminded that this struggle is for so many a struggle of life and of death. That said, friends and comrades, as we step into our second century, I'm filled with hope that our party will continue to live up to its historic task and that its members will each day prove themselves worthy of the name communist in carrying out the struggle for the liberation of all nations and oppressed peoples. Thank you very much. Merci, merci Tyson. Um... Pour euh, continuer, euh, nous allons euh, maintenant euh, vous présenter un euh, synopsis d'un documentaire euh, qui sera disponible à partir de, de juin prochain. C'est un extrait, euh, alors euh, euh, vous pouvez procéder à visionner, euh, s'il vous plaît. Anybody can be revolutionary. Anybody can be revolutionary. It's more difficult to be revolutionary when the conditions 
are not revolutionary. When people are filled with reformist ideas and reformist illusions. There was this impression that Marxism was dead, socialism was dead, and by extension communist parties um, were dead as well. And in fact, we know that some communist parties actually did disappear. You can't kill an idea. And the idea of people having a society in which the means of production are not owned by a parasitic class, that idea is uh, you can't kill it. A lot of us came out, you know, kind of battle scarred. May suffer defeat, setback, but ultimately, in the competition between capitalism and socialism, ultimately, socialism will win. Well, we live at a, a moment in human history when it's quite clear capitalism has absolutely nothing left to offer the people of this planet. This is a class war! Change is definitely in the air. You might say that we were a little bit ahead of our time. We are going to fight like hell for every single policy of red here and some that aren't here. The party has a real history of struggle in this country. We are a revolutionary party striving to win the people of this country for socialism. I remember very well going to my party club and meeting comrades, uh, some of whom were in the Mackenzie Papado brigades fighting against fascism in Spain. Uh, people who uh, were in the, the forefront of uh, building the trade union movement. When I think back on my life in the party, it just seems like a blur. We were involved in so many things, almost every major campaign. When I joined the Communist Party of Canada in 1959, the Cold War was in full state. Taking our country out of the camp of imperialist war and fitting it into the camp of peace and progress towards socialism. I feel I've never been anything but a member of the Communist Party. I believe in socialism and I believe that when you attain socialism, you should defend socialism. A movement that isn't just through time, and our party has a hundred years, and I'm part of that hundred years, and that's what feels significant to me is this connectivity to to history but also through space you know it's not just a rhetorical slogan to say that we really are an internationalist movement that we are one large family worldwide my roots are in india my head is in canada but my heart is in cuba Jim uh, uh, continued the fight for national liberation for the indigenous peoples right up to the end of his life in the late 1960s. Uh, he's an inspiration for all of us who have Métis families in our backgrounds and uh, uh, for all party members, in fact, that we've been in this struggle for almost our entire century. I was infused with that worldview, you know, like which class do you belong to? And there was quite a campaign quite a campaign. Someone asked me, why are you running? Uh, is it to raise issues or do you want to get elected? And I said, I want to be elected. The party has made it possible for me to follow my star. That is to say, to devote my life to work for my ideal, for socialism. And how many people have an opportunity to give every day of their lives to work for something they believe in? I'm, I'm telling you, but it's that it's the party of the future. It's the only party that they can actually save the world, in my opinion. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. Uh, you may not know, but that's, a, that's just a clip, of course, of a film that will be released later uh, in June. And uh, I think we're all going to just love seeing that. I know I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you for that. Uh, maintenant, je vais présenter Miguel Figueroa. Miguel était le chef du parti pendant uh, 20, 26 uh, ans. Uh, and Miguel will be uh, giving some words about the party veterans, uh, many party veterans and the contribution they've made. So Miguel, please. Well, thanks, uh, Dave, and uh, good day, everyone. Uh, I've been asked to spend a few minutes to recognize and appreciate 
uh, those who've served our party so well over so many years in various capacities and fields of work to build our party and to serve our class and not least to advance our revolutionary goal of achieving the victory of socialism here in Canada and around the world. As we think back over the past hundred years of our illustrious history, we remember the many contributions and achievements of our party in organizing the unorganized, forging many of the industrial and public sector unions and leading epic strike struggles, which helped to advance the rights of all workers in building the farmers and agricultural workers movements for survival and dignity in organizing the ranks of Canada's unemployed during the Great Depression, struggles which helped to secure unemployment insurance. In mobilizing thousands of young volunteers to fight against fascism in Spain and later across Europe during the Second World War. In helping to build the broad peace and disarmament movement in the post-war years, as well as in building the solidarity campaigns with the national liberation movements in Africa and Asia, against the US blockade and in defense of socialist Cuba, with the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, against the fascist Pinochet regime in Chile after the 1973 coup d'etat, and in solidarity with Palestine, Syria, Nicaragua, Yugoslavia, Venezuela, and other victims of US imperialist aggression. To this we can add in fighting against colonial and national oppression within our own country and to win recognition for the rights of self-determination for Quebec and the indigenous nations and peoples across Turtle Island. <clears throat> in engaging in the struggle um, against racism and for women's equality, gen gender equity, and the rights of the LGBTQ2 uh, plus immigrant and minority communities. And in helping to build broad movements for civic reform, universal health care and in defense of Canadian sovereignty. We remember with pride all of these and many other class and democratic struggles in which our party has played a significant and often a leading role. And we remember too, that from our party's very inception, sorry, from our party's earliest uh, very, uh, uh, inception in 1921, our comrades have had to carry out their revolutionary work in circumstances of unrelenting hostility and attacks from Canada's ruling capitalist class and its state. The periods when our party was forced to work under conditions of illegality, when Tim Buck and other party leaders uh, were convicted and imprisoned, the various forms of state repression, such as section 98 of the criminal code, the War Measures Act and the Padlock Law in Quebec, amongst others, which were all used to curtail our activity and to persecute our members. The McCarthy style witch hunts, which targeted our members and supporters uh, in the trade union movement and especially in those communist led unions and the constant ideological propaganda and physical attacks against our party. We remember all of those difficult days and we honor the memory of those comrades who endured such outrages with courage and resolve. Short story, it's not easy being a communist, much less one who perseveres, who sticks with the party through thick and thin, through all the vagaries of the class struggle over the course of one's lifetime. Some people ask us, not in a critical or disparaging way, but just because they they really want to know. They ask us, are you communist crazy or what? Who else attends meetings three to four times a week when you could be firing up the barbecue or watching a ball game? Who else schedules educationals and schools, conferences and conventions on long weekends and stat holidays? And there's more. Being a Communist Party membership, member rather, is hardly a wise career move. That's if you're seeking to get ahead in this sordid capitalist rat race. No perks, no dividends, no gravy on this particular train, just hard work, dedication, motivated by our confidence in the ultimate victory of socialism, communism, 
and the achievement of a better future for all the peoples of Canada and for humanity as a whole. And what unites us is not just this lofty goal, this shared vision of a better tomorrow, but also an understanding that the working class, the oppressed and exploited, need a disciplined, politically advanced party, a revolutionary vanguard to achieve that brighter future. In the final analysis, this is what being a party member is all about. That's why, especially on the centenary, we take a moment to honor all of those who came before us, who contributed so much of their creative talents and energies to build our great party. Many of these comrades are no longer with us, but many others are giving freely of their time and abilities to this noble cause, to this revolutionary project. Some are serving in leadership capacities in our party at various levels. Others are what might be called in the trade union movement, rank and filers, distributing our press and party literature, supporting workers on picket lines, carrying our banners and flags in rallies and protests, and in a myriad of other ways. So on this occasion, we wish to express our respect, appreciation, and admiration to these comrades, those who have been in the party for 25 years or more of continuous service. Each of the following will receive a special certificate of recognition. Here it is here. I don't know if you can see it or not. Probably not. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, they will receive the special certificate in recognition of their many years of value, dedication, and service. And I want to read it out to you, if I might. It says, on the centenary of the birth of the Communist Party of Canada, the Central Committee recognizes the name of the comrade, veteran member and builder of the Communist Party, veteran fighter for the working class and for peace and social progress, a champion of socialism and a fighter for a socialist Canada, in which the exploitation of one human being by another is forever relegated to the dustbin of history and where racism, oppression, and war are mere footnotes in historical manuscripts. Excusez-moi. Oui, parfait. Merci, Miguel. Euh, je voulais euh, mentionner que, bah, en fait, Frédéric Gel disait euh, que la lutte se déroule dans trois domaines politique, économique et, et culturelle aussi. Et dans ce sens, euh, nous présentons la, nous apprécions beaucoup en fait la contribution euh, de notre euh, camarade euh, Norman Raymond, qui euh, justement perçoit la culture comme un, un facteur de mobilisation euh, révolutionnaire. Alors, euh, Norma est notre talentueux auteur, euh, compositeur, euh, interprète, traducteur et aussi poète. Et, il a des, des racines françaises, irlandaises, écossaises et Anichi Nabe. Et Norma milite principalement euh, en faveur euh, du droit de l'autodétermination des peuples autochtones. Alors, euh, sans tarder, euh, je vous laisse euh, avec euh, Normand Raymond qui va, qui va nous interpréter euh, euh, deux chansons euh, dans le cadre de cet hommage. Et bonjour, euh, camarades. Et bonjour, euh, tout le monde. Donc, euh, je, vais, je vais me traduire aussi en anglais. Et donc, euh, je vais vous présenter deux chansons. Le, le premier est un chant euh, Anishinaabe, un chant très ancien. Euh, ça s'appelle le Thunderbird Song, le chant de l'oiseau tonnerre. Et donc, euh, ça, ça a plus de 100 ans. <rire> ça a quelques centaines d'années. Donc, on est dans les centenaires. Et euh, c'est en langue Anishinaabe, bien sûr. Il y a des paroles. Uh, so in English, um, the first song I, I'm going to uh, present you is an Anishinaabe song. Uh, um, it's a very old song. 
more than a uh, hundred year, maybe a, a few hundred years. <laughs> and it's, um, there's a lyric in it, uh, in Anishinaabe uh, Moen, like uh, Ojibwe, Algonquin. So it's called the uh, Thunderbird Song. Donc, c'était ça avant la première chanson, ou plutôt le premier chant. Maintenant, euh, je vais vous faire une chanson en français. Uh, I'm going to sing you a chant. C'est en fait c'est une composition sur les paroles d'un poème de Géléno. Géléno a été membre du Parti euh, communiste du Canada durant une dizaine d'années, dans les années 40. Euh, il a été syndicaliste et euh, militant. Euh, il était auprès de Léa Roback et, et euh, Madeleine Parent. Et euh, c'est ça, il était poète, journaliste, traducteur, et critique littéraire, artistique. Donc, euh, une personne importante. So, the next song is going to be uh, a composition of mine uh, with uh, um, the lyric of, uh, it's a poem of uh, Gilles Eno, uh, Quebec uh, uh, poet. He, he, 
he was a member of the Communist Party of Canada for about uh, 10 years uh, during the 40s, more or less. He was uh, beside the, he was a, a unionist. Uh, I think he was, uh, he, he was sent to Sudbury for uh, the mining uh, companies for uh, a few years. He was a journalist, a translator, poet, one of the, um, well, the modernist uh, poet. En fait, uh, je reviens en français. <laughs> Uh, Gaston Miron uh, disait de Gileno que c'était uh, le père de la, la poésie uh, moderne uh, au Canada uh, ici au Québec. So uh, Gaston Miron uh, said he was uh, the the father of the modern uh, poetry in Canada and, and uh, mostly in the French uh, Canada. Uh, so um, the poem I put in music uh, is called uh, Voici venir le temps. So uh, <laughs> le poème que je vais vous, uh, c'est-à-dire le, le, la chanson que je vais vous chanter, uh, c'est sur le poème de Gilino uh, pour titre uh, Voici venir le temps. Here comes the time. And I think it's... Uh, here came the time for the celebrating the 100 years of the party, <laughs> Communist Party of Canada. Donc, c'était, c'est vraiment approprié pour uh, célébrer le, le centenaire du Parti communiste du Canada. Donc, je vous laisse avec uh, cette chanson. Et c'est, je l'ai composé l'an dernier. Et donc, voici. Oh. Ceux qui acceptent la lumière et la nuit de nos pauvres années, je suis de ceux qui lisent l'ombre de nos mains sur nos actions futures. Je suis de ceux qui parlent la bouche pleine d'une amère certitude. De ceux qui voient sortilège de la terre dans les regards des femmes. Je suis de ceux qui peignent chevelure des comètes. Je suis de ceux qui savent que le miracle est dans l'homme. La lumière est prise au piège Voici venir le temps des regards clairs Et des beautés nouvelles Après l'enfer des métamorphoses Après l'enfer des métamorphoses accepte la lumière et la nuit de nos pauvres années je suis de ceux qui lisent l'ombre de nos mains sur nos actions futures je suis de ceux qui parlent la bouche pleine d'une amère certitude je suis de ceux qui 
baisse de la terre dans les regards des femmes. Je suis de ceux qui peignent les chevelures des comètes. Je suis de ceux qui savent que le miracle est dans l'homme. Les blessures d'hier, la paix fera couler ses grandes eaux sur la cendre de nos espoirs incendiés, de nos espoirs incendiés. Au miroir du ciel ne se penchera plus la sanglante moisson des hommes et la peau du diable séchera aux quatre vents. Sèchera aux quatre vents Comme un épouvantail à corbeau Nos enfants seront la bête Et reviendra le prince charmant Thank you, voilà. thank you, Normand. Thank you, merci beaucoup. Merci. <laughs> Now uh, we're going to have some words from Ivan Bayard. Ivan is the General Secretary of the Young Communist League of Canada. Uh, Ivan, are you there? Yeah, hi, comrades. Thanks, Dave. Um, okay, uh, comrades, friends, thank you for taking the time to join with us as we celebrate 100 years of struggle. My name is Ivan Bayard, and as the General Secretary of the Young Communist League, League de la Jeunesse Communiste, I'm here to deliver greetings on behalf of our organization. Our relationship with the party in many ways defines the League. The League was built and rebuilt more than once by members of the party. They were committed to a project that can both be a vehicle to advance the struggle and a classroom to reflect and grow together. When the YCLLJC was first founded in 1923, the party was still faced with intense state repression and operated in clandestine conditions due to being illegal under the War Measures Act. So the first communist youth organization was known as the Young Workers League. Within the first 15 years, the builders of the YCL-LJC made an organization that could coordinate campaigns coast to coast as part of the peace movement, labor movement, some campuses, and organizing the unorganized. The YCL-LJC was by no means a mass organization, even at this time, but because of their discipline and unity in action, they were able to make a real contribution to the Onto Ottawa Trek, the Workers' Unity League, the Canadian Youth Congress, which had a peak membership of over 400,000, as well as the Mackenzie Papineau Volunteer Brigade to fight fascism. The tools these early fighters for socialism used are the same ones that today we as young communists are working to grasp. Consistency, practice, planning, timing, and camaraderie. And that last one might be the most important. At the heart of it, it means trust and belief. Every YCL LJC member learns at their first school that we are materialists and we are fighting idealists. However, we still have big ideas that motivate us. We are trying to envision a united people fighting for the way forward, where everyone has a life with dignity, where the youth have a future. So without abandoning our militancy and day-to-day -day campaigning, we acknowledge we are trying to build something that we haven't seen. So we have to trust and believe in each other as comrades, as essential pieces of the social revolution puzzle. The YCL LJC is different from many of our sister organizations. We are neither the youth wing of the party nor a communist party for young people. We are not a mass organization or a front or an incubator for younger comrades until they finish their de-Twitterization re-education. What we are at this stage is a place for young communists to grow collectively by being engaged in the student and youth uh, struggles. In the YCLJC, I learned the indispensable skills of making wheat paste, folding brochures, picking up the phone and calling comrades, not printing enough agendas, and finding red flags at marches. Due to the precarious nature of young people, they finish school or start school, move out or move back in, Turnover is a natural process for all youth organizations. Combine that with our organizational autonomy from the party, and there's always room for our members to become caters. The current double-edged worldwide health and economic crisis has had the most devastating effects in the global south, where the majority of humanity lives, many in deep poverty and with limited or no access to healthcare. 
In every capitalist country, the pandemic has hit hardest the poor, the elderly, indigenous peoples, frontline workers in healthcare and other essential services, many of whom are women and low paid and precarious workers. Here in Canada, the capitalist class is placing a large burden of the economic fallout on young workers. Since March of last year, employment rates for young people have reached lows not seen since the Great Depression. Amidst the worst pandemic in 100 years, young workers and students have seen the wealthiest people in the country hoarding billions of dollars while jobs have disappeared and debt interest has accumulated. It is clear what the state can and cannot afford. The imperialist system demands the, profits can, the drive for profits continue with total disregard for human life, steamrolling anything in its path. The worsening of conditions means our movement is on the march. In the YCLLJC, we are experiencing a flood of applications. People used to ask if socialism was really possible, but now more and more are asking how much longer can capitalism go on? Anyone that joins our league going forward, forward will have been born after the Soviet Union ceased to exist. A first for our organization, which was forged in the wave of optimism following 1917. The disappearance of the Soviet Union, the bulwark in the international struggle for socialism was a serious blow to the working class of the world. However, it was not the end of history that some had hoped for. 150 years ago, almost to the day, the first dictatorship of the proletariat ended with red flowing down the streets of Paris rather than billowing above in the sky. The bloody week that brought the commune to an end with executions and exiles did not mark an end to the working class movement. Rather, it became an inspiration for the next 50 years of struggle leading to the formation of the Third International. In the same way, the disappearance of the Soviet Union only proves that for almost 75 years, workers charted their own, charted their own course despite the efforts of the international capitalist class to overturn the revolution. We learn from these experiences, avoiding the practice of adultery and myth-making while still recognizing and defending the accomplishments that the struggle for socialism has brought to humanity. As young communists, the best gift we can give the party on centenary is our commitment to building the movement for socialism. The tasks ahead of us will require discipline and fortitude, but also opportunities to learn and grow collectively, to forge new and lasting bonds as comrades and do more than just interpret the crisis around us. The ruling class has plenty of distractions for young people and it is our role to raise class consciousness and bring our generation to the fight. The challenges we need to impose on ourselves in order to build the league are certainly daunting, but every new recruit means that the load is lightened. We stand on the shoulders of our forebears as we continue their work in the second century that will build socialism in Canada. We have a long and proud history of struggle for the emancipation of working people, both in Canada and around the world. And as young communists, it is our job to continue the history of struggle and to keep the red flag flying. Thank you. Merci, uh, Aidan. Um, notre, um, notre prochaine invitée, um, c'est Monique Verbet. Um, elle est militante du Parti communiste du Canada et de la Ligue de la jeunesse communiste à Winnipeg. Euh, elle citera quelques passages euh, de Norma Bétu, euh, faisant allusion à Isadora Donc, euh, je ne sais pas si, euh, Monique, euh, tu, es, tu es en ligne en ce moment. Je t'invite. Merci beaucoup. Oui, yes, so, um, hello everyone, I'm going to read um, something very inspiring that Norman Bethune uh, quoted and said, as well as uh, Isadora Duncan. Well, uh, you'll see. So um, yes, essentially in the summer of 1935, Norman Bethune and three others, including Dr. Frederick <coughs> Banting, the co-discoverer of insulin went to Soviet Russia to attend the International Physiological Congress being held in Leningrad. He attended the first session and then spent the rest of his trip vis visiting hospitals, clinics, and surgeries, studying the practice of socialized medicine in the world's first socialist country. On their return to Canada, the doctors reported on their experiences at a meeting sponsored by the Medical Chirurgical Society of Montreal. Most of the reports were technical or scientific, with the accompanying shots at working class power that could have been made today and are about Cuba, about beautifully tiled bathrooms without toilet paper, about red tape, about difficulties getting tickets for transport, etc. Bethune waited until the end, 
and spoke about the world of topsy-turvy, pointing out that interpretation depended on the observer's perspective. Perhaps it was capitalism that was upside down and not socialism. He then said this, Isadora Duncan in the story of her life describes her confinement. There I lay, she wrote, a fountain of spouting blood, milk and tears. What would a person think watching for the first time a woman in labor and not knowing what was happening to her? Would he not be appalled at the blood the agony, the apparent cruelty of the attendants, the whole revolting technique of delivery, he would cry, stop this, do something, police, murder. Then tell him he was seeing a new life brought into the world and that the pains would pass, that the agony and ugliness were necessary and always would be necessary to birth. Knowing this then, what could he say truthfully about this woman as she lies there? Is she not ugly? Yes. Is she not beautiful? Yes. Is she not pitiful, ludicrous, grotesque, and absurd? Yes. Is she not magnificent and sublime? Yes. And all of these things would be true. Now, Russia is going through her delivery. And the midwives and obstetricians have been so busy keeping the baby alive that they haven't got around as yet to cleaning up the mess. And it is this mess, this ugly and uncomfortable mess, which affronts the eyes and elevates the noses of those timid male and female virgins suffering from sterility of the soul, who lack the imagination to see behind the blood, the significance of birth. Creation is not and never has been a genteel gesture. It is rude, violent, and revolutionary. But to those courageous hearts who believe in the unlimited future of man, in the divine destiny which lies in his own hand to make what he will, to these Russia presents today the most exciting spectacle of the revolutionary, emergent, and historic spirit of man which has appeared on the earth since the Reformation. To deny this is to deny our faith in men, and that is the unforgivable sin, the final apostasy. Thank you. Merci, uh, Monique. Uh, thank you. Um, une uh, des caractéristiques uh, des partis communistes uh, est bien sûr la fraternité et la solidarité internationale entre les peuples et leur euh, lutte révolutionnaire. Et dans le cadre de, cette, euh, de ces centenaires euh, du Parti communiste de, du Canada, euh, le parti a reçu euh, plus de 40 salutations euh, de l'international. Donc, euh, nous procédons à, à montrer Euh, une partie euh, des discours euh, enregistrés euh, préalablement. Donc, euh, je vous laisse euh, avec euh, les discours euh, des salutations. Merci. Communist Party of Australia. As a fraternal party that has also recently commemorated its 100 years, we can envision the sentiments of our comrades as they prepare to celebrate the centenary of the Communist Party of Canada. You have a rich history of struggle to look back on, exemplary comrades to celebrate, and will find both lessons and motivation for your future work. Communist Party of Britain. Our parties have maintained close links throughout our histories. Today, we pay tribute to a party founded in illegal conditions and repeatedly banned throughout most of the last century because its members stood true to the revolutionary traditions of Marx and Lenin. Communists of Catalonia. The Communist Party of Canada in this century has been in the forefront of the struggles of the working class, the fight for the women's rights, the fight for the First Nations, Inuit and Métis, the right of self-determination in Quebec, and in general, all the struggles for the liberation of humankind, like many communists around the world. The Communist Party of Canada has fulfilled its internationalist duty, and not just by word, but by facts. 
For instance, comrade Norman Bethune or all the heroes of the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion who also came to fight in Catalonia and Spain against fascism. But we communists are not nostalgic. We are proud of our past, but in order to change our future. In front of us, we have a bright future. We have many years of struggles and we have to build a road to socialism. In this fight, you will always have your comrades of Catalonia at your side. Communist Party of Chile. Our people will always appreciate the enormous solidarity that emanated from Canada in the hard years of the fascist dictatorship that ravaged our country for so long. Solidarity in which the Communist Party of Canada was always on the front line. We understand that the history of your country has not been fair to the Canadian communists, and for decades it has tried to hide the true role that you have played. Even so, the memory of so many fighters for peace and socialism in Canada will never be forgotten. Communist Party of China On the occasion of the centenary of the Communist Party of Canada, the International Department of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China wishes to extend warm congratulations to all comrades of CP Canada. CP Canada has for long made active efforts to disseminate Marxism, safeguard labor rights, and promote social equity. The Communist Party of China is willing to continue exchanges and cooperation with CP Canada for the benefit of mutual learning and new contributions to the friendship between the Chinese and Canadian people and to world peace and development. Communist Party of Cuba. The CPC has always been an example in the struggle for peace, labor rights, safe working conditions, the equality and emancipation of women, public education and social justice. Also, it has been striving for decades against poverty, racism, military interventions, climate change, and imperialism. Today, socialism is more urgently needed than ever before. We are facing a global COVID-19 pandemic that has caused more than 3 million deaths, a deep economic crisis, and increased unemployment aggravated by the neoliberal capitalist system. We ratify friendship with the CPC and our firm decision to build a sustainable and prosperous socialist system and defend the Cuban Revolution and the legacy of our eternal leader, Fidel Castro. Progressive Party of Working People, Cyprus, ACO. We know the CPC as a party that has been standing up against imperialist interventions and for international solidarity, for cooperation with the Communist and Workers' Parties in order to face the increasing challenges facing humanity and the progressive forces in particular. We appreciate your work and sharing of knowledge in the struggle against environmental destruction and for the rights of the First Nations. On this occasion, we reiterate Akel's readiness to strengthen further our long-standing relations and common struggles for social progress, prosperity, and peace. Two-Day Party of Iran The Communist Party of Canada has a proud history of relentless struggle against the backdrop of one of the world's advanced capitalist systems and one that neighbors that of U.S. imperialism. The Communist Party of Canada has consistently been at the forefront of the struggle for the rights of working people in the country, whether employed in agriculture, industry, the professions, or the emerging information technology sector in a protected and sustainable environment. Your party has continuously advocated for women's equal rights across the whole spectrum of Canadian society, and women comrades have led the struggle for full gender equality and socialism there. We note with interest and admiration your consistent advocacy and championing for the full rights of all national and ethnic groups in Canada, including Indigenous people. Workers' Party of Korea. We highly appreciate your party's active struggle to safeguard and realize the interests of working people with the banner of socialism held up high for the long period of a century since its foundation. Convinced that the friendly and cooperative relationship between our two parties will further expand and develop in the future, we take this opportunity to sincerely wish your party great success in its activities. Communist Party of Mexico. We appreciate the history of consequent struggle of the CP of Canada an internationalist example taken to very high level with Norman Bethune in the complex conditions of the struggle. We appreciate the defense of Marxism-Leninism, of communist ideals in the harsh counter-revolutionary times of the 90s. 
We hold in high esteem the contribution of the Canadian Communists against NAFTA, against the FTAA, and the Initiative for the International Fight Against Multilateral Investment Agreement, the MIA. We are together in the common struggle of all North American workers against the TMEC, or USMCA. We are honored to share that common trench. Communist Party of Pakistan. We in the Indian subcontinent recently celebrated the One Century Journey, which was a long and turbulent journey from independence to the partitions of the subcontinent and still continue our struggle in Pakistan in the most difficult period. We are proud that the Communist Party of Canada was always on our side and showing its solidarity with our party and with the working class struggle at every time of our turbulent journey. Philippine Communist Party, PKP 1930. The CPC can be truly proud of its history of a century of struggles for the advancement of people's rights and workers' power, for the defense of socialism and for proletarian internationalism. Alternating between legality and illegality for many decades, the CPC always maintained its leadership of many battles of the Canadian working class in mines, logging camps, railways, factories and farms. Even during periods of illegality, CPC leaders have succeeded in getting elected to public offices in municipal, provincial and federal levels, championing, among others, public educational and healthcare services, social services and socialized medicine, and indigenous people's rights. Thank you very much. That's a wonderful sampling of uh, some of the more than 40 international greetings that we received from fraternal parties all over the world. And there'll be more coming up later in our, in our program. Uh, now it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker. Um, Elizabeth Rowley is the leader of the Communist Party of Canada. And she's going to uh, present some, some words, some thoughts, some analysis about the history uh, of this uh, of this party, the wonderful points of our history. It's hard to summarize all of that hundred years into uh, into thirty minutes, but uh, Liz is going to do her best. <laughs> Liz, please. Thank you, Comrade Chair. Good dear Comrade. Well, the hundred year history of the Communist Party of Canada is the history of working class struggle in this country, even before its birth. The Communist Party was declared an illegal organization by the Canadian government, terrified by the widespread support for the Great October Socialist Revolution given by the workers and many trade unions in Canada. The 1917 Russian Revolution broke the chains of imperialism's global domination, burst the world's first socialist state, and opened the global epoch of the transition from capitalism to socialism. For the first time in history, socialism ceased being only a theory and became a reality, a country that working people around the world could claim as their own. Within three months, Winston Churchill pulled together invading armies from 13 countries, including Canada, to destroy revolutionary Russia and the global grass fire of revolutionary activity the Great October ignited. Communist parties everywhere were made illegal following Church's, Churchill's declaration that we must smash the Bolshevik eggs in the nest before they hatch. But the working class in Canada refused to lie down and instead the hands off Russia campaign took flight with many labor organizations raising money and supplies for Soviet Russia and expressing hopes for a socialist revolution and workers Soviets here in Canada. That led to the historic Winnipeg General Strike of 1919, which was a magnificent display of working class unity and militancy, but was smashed by the police and military on orders from Ottawa. 30,000 strikers were routed with hundreds injured and arrested. The painful lesson learned was that the state was not neutral and would always serve the interests of the class in power. The strike weapon alone was not, would not bring down the capitalist state. For that, a revolutionary political party of the working class, a party of a new type with a revolutionary theory was essential. On May 28th and 29th, 20, uh, 1921, the Communist Party of Canada was born. 
delivered by 22 delegates representing 650 members in a barn in Guelph, Ontario. The delegates vo voted to join the Comintern and the Red International of Labour Unions. Because of the War Measures Act, the party had to work underground. And so the Workers' Party was set up as the party's legal arm in December. The Workers' Party adopted a five-point program in 1922 that called for a workers' republic, working, working class political, uh, political action, trade union unity, a party of action, and a party press. The party's newspaper, The Worker, was established a few months later. During the early 20s, the Workers' Party organized the Trade Union Educational League. Its purpose was to win support for the formation of militant class-based unions and to promote the amalgamation of the industrial and craft unions leading to one, one union in each industry. The Trades and Labour Congress responded with a ferocious attack on the Workers' Party for, quote, aiming to poison the minds of workers against the present trade union and labor organizations and ultimately make them instruments for the establishment of communism, unquote. But they couldn't stop the surge of struggle and militancy that the Trade Union Educational League inspired. Its program called for organizing the unorganized, building a shop stewards movement with active shop committees of rank and file members in every workplace united and independent labor political action, Canadian trade union autonomy, affiliation of every trade union to the Trades and Labor Congress, building a workers press, including shop papers, world trade union unity, nationalization of industry, and abolition of capitalism in favor of socialism. The program was endorsed by organizations representing one third of the trade union movement by 1925. And 50% of union locals had declared support for amalgamation and Canadian autonomy. In 1921, the Canadian Labour Party was born. A federated party of labour comprised mainly of communists and social democrats. It won great influence amongst workers for its policies for unemployment insurance nationalizing the banks and other radical demands before it was scuttled by right-wing social democrats opposed to unity with the communists. Though its life was relatively brief, the Canadian Labour Party showed that a federated party of labour had the potential to become a powerful political force in Canada's parliament. The Workers' Party also set up the Progressive Farmers Educational League to further its objective of labour-farmer unity and the Federation of Women's Labour Leagues to organize women into trade unions, strike support, and to build a movement for peace amongst women workers. In 1923, the Young Workers League was established, later uh, the Young Communist League. In 1925, the party set up the Canadian Labour Defence League, led by A.E. Smith and Betty Buhay, Becky Buhay, sorry, to defend workers in the Alberta coal strike. The CLDL defended the Estevan minor strike in 1931, including Annie Buller and Sam Scarlett, who were sent there by the Workers' Unity League. They were sentenced to one year hard labor. By 1929, the Conservative AFL and the Trades and Labor Congress in Canada were demanding the expulsion of communists. In 1931, the Communist Party was declared illegal for the second time under Section 98 of the Criminal Code, and eight communist leaders were arrested and incarcerated in Kingston Penitentiary, charged with sedition. They were finally released after prison guards attempted to assassinate Tim Buck during a prison riot. 25,000 people flooded Maple Leaf Gardens to greet Tim Buck on his release in 1934. The play Eight Men Speak was banned after just one performance. The Workers' Unity League was formed in January 1930 with Tom McEwen as its national secretary. Its purpose was to organize workers into the mass production industries, into powerful industrial unions under rank and file control to defend and advance their living and working conditions and ultimately for the overthrow of the capitalist system. It had a major focus on internal union democracy and membership control 
and was itself a militant labor central, which workers could join, quote, regardless of race, creed, color, sex, craft, or political affiliations. While the reformist unions lost members, the Workers' Unity League grew rapidly with a membership of 40,000 by 1934. It led 90% of the strikes in Canada between 1933 and 1936, winning a majority of them. The Workers' Unity League laid the basis for the organization of large-scale industrial unions in the mass production industries. The Workers' Party also set up the Farmers' Unity League to organize farmers threatened with foreclosures and evictions by the banks. The Farmers' and Workers' Unity Leagues jointly organized many of the big hunger marches through the 1930s. The Workers' Unity League aimed to unite the struggles of the employed and the unemployed. The key demands were jobs and non-contributory unemployment insurance. They also demanded family allowance. In 1935, the Onto Ottawa Trek left Vancouver with a thousand people riding the rails to Ottawa. When they reached Regina, they were stopped by police and military. A delegation of eight led by Slim Evans continued to Ottawa where Prime Minister R.B. Bennett refused to hear their demands. Immediately, 800 unemployed from across Southern Ontario hit the road, walking 250 miles to Ottawa while trekkers from Winnipeg were turned back by police at the Ontario border. Those in Regina were surrounded by police with machine guns, then attacked and beaten with more than 100 shot and 117 arrested, including Slim Evans. Mass protests swept the country, leading to Iron Hill Bennett's defeat in the 1935 federal election. The new government of Mackenzie King was forced to close the relief camps and rescind section, section 98 in 1936 and to introduce unemployment insurance legislation in 1940. This was improved in the 50s and 60s before being raided for corporate tax cuts by liberal governments in the 90s. Family allowance was enacted five years later in 1945, the first universal social program in Canada. The Communist Party emerged from this period firmly established in the minds of Canadian workers as an unshakable champion of the rights and interests of the working class, the farmers and the unemployed. In 1935, the Workers' Unity League dissolved and took all of its affiliated unions into the CIO, where industrial unionization moved forward quickly. Some of the most important battles in labor history took place during the following two years to secure the right to organize and for union recognition by employers and governments. Steel, auto, the Canadian Siemens Union, Mine Mill, IWA, UE, UAW, Amalgamated Clothing Workers and International Ladies Garment Workers were all organized under the umbrella of the CIO in Canada by Communist Party organizers and, and union leaders, including such people as Harry Hunter, Dick Steele, Tom McClure, Harry Hamburg, George McEachern, Bill Ross, Cyril Prince, Harold Perchette, Jean Corbin, Bruce Magnuson, Tom Hill, Harvey Murphy, Ross Russell, George Harris, Jean Perre, Leah Roback, Dewar Ferguson, Homer Stevens, and others. By the end of 1937, the CIO had an affiliated membership of 76,000 in Canada. In response, the Conservative AFL and the Trades and Labour Congress in Canada expelled all the CIO unions. In Quebec, the reactionary Duplessis government enacted the Padlock Law in 1937, officially named an act to protect the province against communistic propaganda, which allowed the police to padlock for one year any building used for propagating communism or Bolshevism. A new labor code barring communists or their sympathizers from holding office, union office in Quebec was also enacted. In 1936, the Spanish Civil War began following a fascist coup against the new Republican government. 
recognized as a dress rehearsal for World War II, communist parties around the world mobilized volunteers to fight for democracy in Spain. In Canada, 1,200 volunteers, half of them members of the Communist Party, to, uh, to join the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion. A majority died in Spain fighting fascism. Dr. Norman Bethune, Canada's most well-known communist, went to Spain and developed the mobile blood transfusion unit, which saved the lives of many who were bleeding to death on the battlefields. Bethune later went on to fight with Mao Zedong's 8th Route Army against the Japanese invaders, where he developed mobile uh, hospitals transported on two horses and set up in caves. Bethune died in China after contracting septicemia from operating without gloves. The Communist Party was declared illegal for the third time in 1940 for its opposition to the phony war. Its assets were seized and many communists were interned under the War Measures Act. The Association of United Ukrainian Canadians, the Russian Federation, the United Jewish People's Order and others were declare, also declared illegal and had their buildings seized as well. When Hitler attacked the Soviet Union in 1941, the Communist Party and the CIO unions responded with a call for total war to defeat fascism in Europe. Many communists and others fought and died fighting fascism in Europe, including many who had fought in Spain while Western governments stood by or actively obstructed. 20 million Soviets died fighting fascism, eventually liberating their own country and most of Europe. In 1943, the party set up the Labour Progressive Party, its legal arm. Workers coming back from the war were ready to fight for the better jobs, wages and living standards they'd been promised when the war was over. The number of days lost to strikes in 1946 rose to four and a half million. Some of the most important were the 1945 Ford strike in Windsor, which won the RAND formula, union recognition, and the union shop. The 1946 steel strike in Hamilton, which cemented these wins for all industrial workers. The 1946 Valley Field textile strike in Quebec which mobilized women textile workers who fought for 100 days against employers, police, scabs, and Duplessis to win a first contract, winning significant gains. And there was the IWA strike, which won big concessions from the lumber companies, and the CSU strike, which won the eight hour day for Great Lakes seamen. All of these strikes were either led by communists or were significantly strengthened by their involvement. During the late 30s and 40s, communists began to be elected and re-elected in cities and provinces across Canada. Doris Nielsen and Fred Rose were elected to the House of Commons in Ottawa from Saskatchewan in Quebec. Bill Kardash, a Spanish war vet, was elected to the Manitoba legislature. And J.B. Salzburg and A.A. McLeod were elected to the Ontario legislature. Dozens of communists were elected across Canada to municipal councils and school boards. The end of the war brought the socialist system of states in Europe. And in 1949, China's successful revolution brought socialism to Asia. The party's membership and influence were growing very quickly across Canada. And combined with the militant strike movement, it was seen as a serious threat by capitalist governments and their corporate masters. The antidote to socialism was the Cold War and the McCarthy witch hunts, which targeted communist leaders in public life and in the trade union movement. The first victim in Canada was Montreal MP Fred Rose, who was arrested on charges of passing state secrets to the USSR during the, uh, during the war. In the US, the Rosenbergs were similarly charged and were electrocuted in 1953, despite a massive international campaign to free them. In 1949, NATO was formed with the explicit purpose to contain communism. The new enemy was communism, the Soviet Union and the socialist countries and the communist parties and party members. Preparations for new confrontations and war began and a massive campaign opened up aimed to drive working people into a state of permanent fear and social conformity 
predicated on anti-communism. A key part of this campaign was to split the World Federation of Trade Unions, which at that time represented unions in both the capitalist and the socialist countries. This was done with the formation of the ICFTU, the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions, uh, created by the AFL in the US and the leadership of the British trade union movement. Another part was to undermine the peace and solidarity movements. Peace and socialism became foreign ideas and their advocates became foreign agitators. Right-wing social Democrats whose control of the labor movement had been successfully challenged by the workers' unity lead led the attack in the labor centrals, expelling the communist-led unions in 1949. Red clauses were introduced, banning communists from holding union office, then union membership. Next, independent labor political action was reduced to support for the CCF during elections and for policies that were moving steadily to the right. This is where right-wing social democracy clearly opted to partner with capital and reaction and to reject cooperation with the Communist Party, opting instead to attack and smash the party's influence and leadership in the Canadian trade union movement. It was a decision that eventually led the NDP to strip its own socialist trappings. Today, the NDP's self-proclaimed goal is to humanize capitalism. When the NDP was formed in 1961, the CLC was incorporated. That completed the transformation of the trade union movement from an independent force with its own political agenda, demands, and independent action into an NDP asset. For years after, the labor movement struggled with NDP policies that curtailed workers' right to strike and that undermined international solidarity with workers' political and economic struggles abroad. Back to work legislation was often supported by the NDP. Well, the NDP came very late to the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa and other struggles for national and socialist and social liberation. Further, the CCF and NDP wanted nothing to do with independent labor political action or membership control of the trade unions, the very things that the communists brought to organizing and mobilizing workers. While the communist led unions took an enormous hit, they continued to organize and mobilize workers. Unable to break these unions with raiding and red baiting, the reformist led CLC was finally forced to admit all of these unions into the CLC in 1968. Once again, they formed the backbone of resistance to class collaboration in the trade union movement. The red clauses had a longer life. In the 1970s, the Communist Party challenged the red clauses in the Steel Workers Union and in the UAW when it ran John Severinsky in the 1972 federal election and Jim Bridgewood in the 1979 election. The Red Clause was largely inoperative in Canada after that. The late 1950s and 60s brought some advances after a long and difficult struggle through the Cold War. The Cuban Revolution brought socialism to the Americas and the Communist Party began to grow again after the battering of the Cold War. The 1960s also brought women into the workforce in huge numbers with the growth of the public sector and public sector unions. The Communist Party had opposed the post-war drive to force women out of the workforce and was a driving force in public sector organizing. CUPE was born in 1963 and led for many years by Great Hart Grace Hartman, a communist and a fearless and formidable trade union leader who aimed to build a militant and class-oriented trade union representing public sector workers across Canada. QP and other public sector unions were all independent Canadian unions, unfettered by conservative international union leadership, which had control over collective agreements, bargaining rights, and political action in Canada. The public sector unions had control over all of these things, accepting the right to strike, and so they wasted no time demanding that, together with pay and employment equity, maternity leave, child care, job security, and strong public services and social programs, health care and education that were adequately funded. They had widespread public support as a result of this. And that fact 
And the fact that two wages in a household significantly increase purchasing power and raise living standards. The fight for Medicare and its enactment in 1966 was a result of this demand for good public services and the strong mobilizations by the trade unions to get it. The outlines of the plan for socialized medicine in Canada had been drawn up by Dr. Norman Bethune while he was practicing in Montreal. The 60s also saw the regeneration of the women's movement and the demand for social, political and economic equality and control over their own fertility through access to birth control and abortion services covered by Medicare. In 1971, the National Action Committee on the Status of Women was born and proceeded to build a powerful coalition of 700 equality seeking organizations, including the Communist Party. It put women's demands on the front burner of Canadian politics and together with the CLC and the Action Canada Network became a significant force for social change in Canada. In 1965, the Parti Communiste du Québec was born, a national entity with control over its internal affairs. It was also a unique section of the Communist Party of Canada. Its birth was a reflection of the Communist Party's understanding of the national question in Canada and a reflection of its preferred option of an equal and voluntary partnership of nations, each with the right of self-determination up to and including the right of secession reflected in a new constitution and a new multinational state. Reflecting this policy, communist delegates to the 1973 CLC convention uh, joined with delegates from Quebec to win the convention for recognition of Quebec's national status and the right of the FTQ to control its own affairs. In 1970, the Trudeau, the Trudeau government, the father, <laughs> invoked the War Measures Act, which, ev which evaporated civil rights across the country and enabled the military occupation of Quebec. More than 500 or innocent people were arrested and detained under the pretext of fighting the FLQ. The Communist Party was the only party in Canada to oppose the War Measures Act and to demonstrate the next day on Parliament Hill and across the country while, while Tommy Douglas fought with his own party over the NDP support. The Communist Party was also the only party in English-speaking Canada to oppose the Clarity Act following the Quebec referendum. The 1960s and 70s ushered in the scientific and technological revolution which revolutionized capitalist production methods, leading to mass layoffs a few years later. The party campaigned for a shorter work week with no loss and take home pay, for job security and for labor to have an equal say over the introduction of new technology in the workplace and to an equal share in its benefits. These were also the decades of an escalating arms race between the US and the USSR sharpening economic and political competition between the two on a background of growing victories for the national liberation movements internationally and a growing peace movement at home. The party was very active in the peace and solidarity movements and in particular with Cuba, Chile, Nicaragua, Grenada, El Salvador, Palestine, Portugal, Angola, and the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. The party also worked hard to build a peace movement and peace sentiment in Canada and fought for an independent Canadian foreign policy of peace, detente and disarmament. Party members collect thousands of signatures and support for the first Stockholm appeal and protested the US wars on Korea and then Vietnam. The demonstrations of mostly communists in the 1950s had swelled to millions globally by the 70s. In 1975, the Vietnamese defeated the US, the greatest military force in history. It was an enormous setback for imperialism. The strike movement escalated through the 70s, 80s and 90s, and the party was very busy on picket lines and in union halls building support and solidarity. In 1972, the biggest general strike ever seen in North America broke out in Quebec when 300,000 workers shut down the economy 
in an illegal strike after the three leaders of the Common Front unions were jailed for a year and their unions and members fined hundreds of thousands of dollars. Workers downed their tools until the government finally released the Common Front leaders. The Parti Communiste du Québec and its members were deeply involved in the strikes, along with UE leader Jean Perret. In 1975, the Trudeau government introduced wage controls after promising not to in the 74 election. A general strike was set for October 14, 1976. The party, the communist-led unions and left immediately went to work to close down as many plants and workplaces as possible across the country and mobilized to bring thousands of workers to protest on Parliament Hill and in provincial capitals across the country. As a result, the general strike was the largest protest in Canadian history with 1.1 million down workers downing tools. The party was also campaigning against racism and white supremacy, working closely with black organizations and the Committee for Racial Equality. In the 1981 election, the party campaigned for legislation to ban the Klan and other white supremacist groups as criminal organizations. The party also campaigned for a just and early settlement of Indigenous land claims, for recognition of Indigenous sovereignty, and for urgent action to create jobs, build housing, and raise living standards, charging genocide by colonial and capitalist governments. The 1983, the Solidarity Coalition was formed in BC, uniting the BC labor movement with the social justice movements against 26 pieces of legislation aimed to smash labor rights and social programs. Operation Solidarity was initiated by Communist Party members. Waves of strikes and protests involving tens of thousands of people took place across the province over four months, including a rally of 80,000 in Vancouver, the largest labor protest ever held in BC. 10 years later, the Ontario Days of Action were launched against the Harris government's attacks, leading to rotating strikes and protests in 11 Ontario cities with the active support of communists in the unions, in the community organizations, and three communist school board trustees in Toronto. As the labor community coalition was ramping up for a province-wide strike, some strike leaders announced an end to the strikes and the government was able to survive for another eight years. Confusion reigned while austerity and the free trade debate unfolded in the lead up to the 1988 federal election. The Mulroney Tories had opposed it in 1984, but embraced it in 1988. A loose coalition of labor and social movements supported by the NDP, the Communist Party and other forces quickly formed to make free trade the key election issue and very nearly won. Ever since, the Communist Party has been the only party to oppose free trade, while the NDP and the CLC leadership have supported it, arguing over side deals, but not the main deal. Uh, though free trade has cost Canada its manufacturing base and tens of thousands of well-paid permanent union jobs. These deals have also brought Canada into lockstep with US foreign policy, with NATO, and with US neoliberal economic policy, including massive corporate tax cuts, deregulation, privatization, attacks on labor and democratic rights, and increased military spending. The party also campaigned for plant closure legislation that would require corporations to show just cause at public tribunals that would have the power to prevent closures, fine corporations, and jail executives. In 1989 to 91, socialism in Europe was overthrown and political leaders, employers and right-wing social democrats all proclaimed the end of socialism. The US political scientist Francis Fukuyama proclaimed the end of history by which he meant the end of working class history and class struggle. Well, it was premature. The crisis hit the Communist Party as a small group in its leadership decided they were no longer Marxist, but as controllers of the party's assets were free to use them as they wished. Dressing themselves up as reformers, 
they began to systematically liquidate the Communist Party from within while cooking up a plan to form a new organization with the party's money. When party members understood what was happening, their objections were met with waves of expulsions that included two of the party's founding members, Bill Sidney and Helen Burpee. In the end, they were defeated and finally scuppered, taking considerable assets with them. All of the vicious attacks by right-wing governments and police, including three declarations of illegality, had been unable to destroy the party, but this inside job came close. Over the years, many of our veteran members and leaders have faced harsh consequences for their decision to fight for socialism and the Communist Party. Some were deported, jailed, interned, harassed by police and RCMP. Others lost their jobs. Some were expelled. But all are veterans of the struggle for socialism in Canada, and none will be forgotten. Included are the leaders of the Communist Party since 1921. Tom Burpee, Tim Buck, Leslie Morris, Bill Cashton, Miguel Figueroa, and all those who played a leading role over these years. We stand on their broad shoulders. In 1993, the Mulroney government attempted to amend the Canada Elections Act so that only parties in parliament at that time would be able to elect to parliament in future. They did this by requiring all registered parties to field a minimum of 50 candidates at every general election with non-refundable campaign deposits of $50,000 each time. And with deregistration and seizure of assets, a consequence of failing to meet these requirements. The party fought the legislation for 10 years in the court of public opinion and in a charter challenge in the courts. The Figueroa, the Figueroa case, as it was known, was finally won despite two government appeals of lower court decisions. That victory is widely regarded today as the one that set the bar for electoral democracy and the rights of small parties in Canada today. Well, the last 20 years have seen the growth of reaction and fascism around the world, including in North America. But we've also seen the growth of resistance. The Indian farmers and workers struggle, the heroic Palestinian struggle, the struggle of the Colombian people, the Syrian people, the struggle in South Sudan, in Yemen, to name just some of them. And in Canada, the awesome struggle of the Quebec students in 2012, and the continuing struggles of Indigenous people, the Black Lives Matter movement against systemic racism, the fight against profit, uh, private for-profit long-term care for employer paid sick days, against evictions, the fight for 15, the successful organizing drive of Fudora and other precarious workers, the fight for childcare and to bring women back into the workforce and the mass protests against climate change. And we see a renewed interest in socialism in Canada and elsewhere too. Our party's rapid growth over the past two and a half years uh, is testament to this new interest. And that growth and interest is accelerating well, why? Because it's becoming increasingly clear that capitalism is the problem and that socialism is the solution. Because capitalism is unable to stop the capitalist economic cycle of boom and bust and the fact that capitalist economic crises are becoming longer and deeper and more destructive with each new cycle because capitalism is unable to end inter-imperialist rivalries and wars for control of the world's wealth, because capitalism is predatory and parasitic by nature. It is quite willing to use biological and chemical weapons to increase profits and strategic interests. Capitalism is barbarism because capitalism is unable to resolve the inevitable struggles of the working class and its allies against capitalist austerity, unemployment, exploitation, racism, oppression, and war, except by force and repression. These are built-in features of the capitalist system because the climate crisis, 
has brought into sharp relief the catastrophic results of capitalism's ruthless exploitation of nature. And because the pandemic has exposed the fact that capitalism is irredeemable, it cannot be reformed. It has no human face. It is a decaying, rotten, and violent thing that will only grow more violent and more rotten the longer it survives. Its progeny is fascism, the cancer that is growing in the world once again. Well, capitalism is the disease and socialism is the cure. The economic crisis of 2008 and 2020 combined with the global pandemic have exposed the reality that we are not all in this together, never have been and never will be. What's needed today is a united and a militant struggle of the working class and its allies for their immediate needs and for fundamental change, which can open the door to socialism. In this struggle, working people can count on the communist party to conduct a fearless and principled fight for their interests, for vital social and economic reforms, for labor, democratic and equality rights, for peace, for climate justice, and for socialism. Well, if you're not a member of the Communist Party, I say join us. Find out more about us and our policies and about the road to socialism in Canada today. We are Canada's party of socialism. And with 100 years experience in the class struggle, we can say with confidence that the future belongs to the working class and the future is socialism. On behalf of the Central Committee, we want to thank all of the communist and workers parties around the world who have sent us greetings today. Long live Marxism, Leninism and working class internationalism. Thank you. Merci, merci Liz. Beaucoup d'histoire, beaucoup d'inspire. Oops. Merci Liz. Beaucoup d'histoire, beaucoup d'expérience et beaucoup d'inspiration pour faire avancer la lutte. Euh, merci pour ces mots puissants. Nous pouvons les traduire et les partager. Uh, we are coming up almost to the end of our program, uh, but there are a few more uh, presentations that we'd like. And the first uh, up is a cultural presentation from Chris Fraser. Chris joined the Communist Party in Calgary in 1980 and served as Young Communist League Central Organizer and then as YCL leader from 1985 to 1990. Chris has also been a member of the Central Committee of and the Central Executive of the Communist Party. And he resisted the liquidation of the party in the late 80s and uh, early 1990s. Chris is currently a historian of Latin America at St. Francis Xavier University uh, in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, where he also serves as a grievance officer for his union. Chris is also an activi activist in the queer community and is very well known locally and, uh, and beyond as a drag performer, including the persona of Joni Cash, the Red Queen. So welcome, Chris. Thank you very much, Dave, and greetings, comrades, from uh, the J.B. McLaughlin Club in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm just going to play a song for you that has been with me ever since I joined the party, pretty much, and uh, it's really uh, my YCL recruiting song, and I used to perform this quite a bit in the 1980s, so I have no idea who wrote it. I don't even know what the actual melody is. Um, back in those days, it was pretty hard to find, so I just made it up. Um, so <laughs> anyways, um, uh, and I'm playing it on that guitar that I've had ever since I joined the party. It's a 12 string uh, Fender. And um, I don't have a lot of fancy equipment, so I have no idea how it's gonna sound, but I think it'll probably sound somewhat like it did uh, when I take this guitar out to street corners to leave for the YCL at Eaton Center. Um, <laughs> anyways, here we go. Um, you ain't been doing nothing if you ain't been called a red. Okay. When I was 
was just a little boy, I used to love parades with banners, flags, and red balloons and maybe lemonade. When I came home one May Day, my playmates father said, those marchers are all commies, tell me, son, are you a red? Well, I wasn't sure just what he meant, my hair back then was brown. Our house was made of plain red brick, like many in the town. So when I told my daddy what my playmate's father said, and he put me up upon his knee, and this is what he said. Kid, you ain't been doing nothing if you ain't been called a red. If you march or red. Suppose when someone took exception to the contours of my nose, or tried to cheat me on the job, or hit me on the head. And when I organized a fight back then, those bastards called me red. Ah, oh, you ain't been doing nothing if you ain't been called red. If you marched or agitated, then you're bound to hear it said. You might as well ignore it or love those words instead, because you ain't been doing. Nothing if you wait to call the red. Well, after I got older, one apartment that I had, there was this classic rock landlord. Let me tell you, he was bad. When he tried to kick me out, I rubbed my hands and said, You haven't seen a struggle if you haven't fought a red. Ah, oh, you ain't been doing nothing if you ain't been called a red. Marched or educated, then you're bound to hear it said. You might as well ignore it or love those words instead, because you ain't been doing nothing if you ain't been called a red. Well, I've done some agitating. Just what else can you do? You can't let them dirty bosses just walk all over you. A prince and you get fired hanging around that coffee mob. Well, I should only have such trouble, buddy. I ain't got a job. Well, you ain't been doing nothing if you ain't been called a red. If you marched or agitated, then you're bound to hear it said. You might as well ignore it or love those words instead because you ain't been doing nothing if you ain't been called a red. Yes, I've done some agitating and I'll do a whole lot more for employment and equality and always against war. There goes that rotten commie. I heard somebody yell, so I figured they were right and I joined the YCL. Well, you ain't been doing nothing if you ain't been called a red. If you marched or agitated, then you're bound to hear it said. You might as well ignore it. Or love those words instead, because you ain't been doing nothing if you ain't been called a red. <laughs> there you go, I made it all the way through. Thank you very much, comrades. <laughs>oui, je suis là. Ah, ok. Merci, merci beaucoup. Je suis en ligne. Je suis avec vous. Okay. I am with you, comrades. Porto. 
Et merci Fabiola d'avoir euh, pris le temps de rappeler que nous célébrons cette année euh, un an depuis la disparition physique de notre camarade Pierre Fontaine. Je suis convaincu que euh, rien ne lui aurait fait plus plaisir que d'être ici parmi nous et voir notre parti communiste fêté, célébrer ses 100 ans. Uh, just a quick word to thanks Fabiola, who, uh, before introducing me, said uh, that, uh, reminded that uh, Comrade Pierre Fontaine passed away a year ago and uh, that uh, for sure he would have been uh, pleased and honored to be with us today, celebrating such a historic moment as the centenary of our party. De tous les aspects qui ont permis à notre parti de gagner le respect et de s'enraciner auprès des travailleurs et des travailleuses ainsi que des masses populaires, l'un mérite d'être mis en exergue, soit notre approche pour une solution démocratique à la question nationale, pour son règlement dans les intérêts de la classe ouvrière. Notre parti a été le premier à reconnaître le Canada comme un État multinational, d'abord en reconnaissant la nation canadienne française, puis les nations autochtones et la nation métisse. À cette reconnaissance s'ajoute celle du droit démocratique inaliénable à l'autodétermination, et ce, jusqu'à y compris au droit à la séparation pour chacune des nations qui peuplent le Canada. Jusqu'à présent, nous sommes non seulement le premier, mais le seul parti politique à lutter pour qu'un tel droit soit reconnu et qu'il soit garanti dans une nouvelle constitution canadienne. Communiste, nous refusons l'idée selon laquelle, au Canada et dans les conditions actuelles en particulier, une lutte de libération nationale aurait préséance sur la lutte pour le socialisme. En ce sens, l'unité des travailleurs et des travailleuses contre leur ennemi commun, c'est-à-dire contre le capitalisme monopoliste d'État, et ce, au-delà des frontières nationales, a préséance sur l'unité nationale. Notre histoire, comme celle du mouvement ouvrier en général, est empreinte d'exemples qui prouvent que les moments d'unité et de lutte commune de la classe ouvrière et des masses populaires sont des moments générateurs de luttes intenses comme de conquêtes sociales importantes. Cependant, nous sommes également conscients et conscientes que cette unité ne peut être réalisée que si nous intégrons en nos revendications et faisons nôtre la lutte pour l'égalité entre les nations. Sans cet aspect important, la voie est toute tracée pour les nationalistes et les chauvinistes qui, sous prétexte d'intérêts nationaux, tente de remplacer la conscience de classe des travailleurs et y substituer une conscience purement nationale, étroite. Recognizing the right to separation does not mean that we support its use, but rather that without this right being guaranteed, just as a marriage without the right to divorce is a forced marriage, the nations that populate a country, except the dominant one, are oppressed nations. This is why, Over the past hundred years, communists in English-speaking Canada have not ceased to struggle against the chauvinism of the great nation, while communists in Quebec and in the oppressed nations have and continue to struggle against narrow nationalism. The creation of the Communist Party of Quebec, or Parti Communiste du Québec, as a distinct national entity within the Communist Party of Canada in 1965 was in response to this imperative for fighting for national equality is to fight for unity. Over the past hundred years, our position on the national question has served the revolutionary interests of the working class. It has also been and continues to be an important factor in the unity of our party. Uh, this is a factor in our ability to sustain and grow and dynamize a resolutely class-based communist party across Canada. Today, when the Canadian economy is increasingly integrated with that of the US, and when as a result, and that is becoming more and more evident as the crisis of capitalism deepens, Canadian foreign policy is increasingly in tune with the warmongering policies of the United States. And so in that context, the unity of the workers and working masses of Canada beyond the national question is more relevant than ever. This unity must be achieved against Canadian imperialism and its status as an active partner of US imperialism for the immediate withdrawal from NATO and NORAD against free trade agreements, which are in fact imperialist agreements as well. And above all for so uh, sovereign policy, foreign policy based on peace, disarmament and international solidarity. Dans ce contexte, nous pouvons être et nous devons être confiants et confiantes que notre politique 
qui se base à la fois sur l'unité de la classe ouvrière comme principe directeur, mais aussi sur la garantie du droit démocratique de toutes les nations à disposer d'elles-mêmes, saura renforcer l'unité de la classe ouvrière dans ses combats à venir, lesquels se concluront, soyons-en confiants aussi, avec la conquête du pouvoir politique, soit avec l'édification du socialisme. Et c'est justement parce que notre perspective sur la question nationale s'inscrit dans le cadre de la lutte pour la transformation révolutionnaire de la société, qu'elle est la seule à proposer une solution véritablement démocratique, mais surtout révolutionnaire à cette question. Adrien, tu es fini? J'ai terminé, oui. D'accord. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Adrien, pour ces paroles. Euh, euh, je vais euh, procéder euh, maintenant euh, à la deuxième partie euh, de, de nos salutations euh, internationales des, des secrets qui ont préparé nos, nos camarades euh, généreusement. Vas-y. Communist Party of Greece. The KKE addresses a warm militant greeting to all the members and executives of the Communist Party of Canada on the 100th anniversary of the founding of your party. We salute the struggles of the CP of Canada that defend the interests of working class and the people in complex and difficult conditions. The KKE appreciates the long-standing ties of friendship and solidarity between our parties. The solidarity of the Canadian Communists to the heroic struggle of the Greek Democratic Army your solidarity and joint action with the Greek immigrants in Canada, but also the contribution of the CP of Canada to the establishment of the international meeting of the Communist and Workers' Parties. Portuguese Communist Party. During this century, the CPC and the Canadian Communists have been the target of numerous persecutions and authoritarian and discriminatory measures that sought to shackle and destroy the party that defends the interests of Canadian workers and which opposes the interests of big capital. The PCP, which also marks its centenary this year, greets the courage and determination of generations of Canadian Communists, who during these 100 years have shown how to build and defend their party resisting all such attacks and fighting the liquidationist tendencies in their midst. The South African Communist Party. The CPC has played a crucial role both in Canada and in the world in supporting the causes of freedom, social justice, peace and national liberation. The achievements of the 1994 breakthrough in South Africa were in large part due to the active and consistent support, mobilization and tangible solidarity towards our struggle by progressives and led by the CPC and its allied forces. The centenary of the CPC is an opportunity to build on this legacy and continue to take the struggle to higher levels, especially in the era of the current pandemic and deep levels of crises of production and reproduction enveloping the world. We are confident that the CPC and its legacy will take our common and joint struggles for a better world for all. Victory is certain. Communist Party of Spain. The Communist Party of Spain will never be able to forget the great act of internationalist solidarity of the hundreds of Canadian brigadistas who initially enlisted in the Lincoln Brigade and later in the Mackenzie Papineau Battalion, making our fight against fascism their own. The work of the Communist Party of Canada at the time was fundamental, among other issues, in organizing the battalion known as the Mac Paps. Forever in our memory is the figure of Norman Bethune, the Brigadista's doctor, promoter of the Canadian Blood Transfusion Service during the Civil War. Through his photographs, the world learned of the criminal episode of La Desbanda, in which five and 10,000 people from Malaga who fled to Almeria were killed by the coup troops. We also remember your resistance to Nazism during the Second World War, without forgetting the comrades who were repressed, many of them in concentration camps. Hasta la victoria siempre, camaradas. The Sudanese Communist Party. The Communist Party of Canada has been an active fighter against imperialism, especially U.S. imperialism, in the Americas. During its hundred years of existence, it has made a valuable contribution to the international solidarity with the peoples of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Of particular importance for the SCP was and remains the solidarity expressed to our people in the struggle against dictatorship and for democracy and social justice. Your solidarity with our people in the struggle for human rights, especially women's rights, is highly appreciated. Communist Party of Swaziland 
The Communist Party of Swaziland is greatly inspired by the working class struggles that the Communist Party of Canada has waged throughout its hundred years of existence. We are aware that your party was the first political party in Canada to actively oppose the centuries-long oppression of Canada's First Nations. This is particularly a crucial aspect for most of us in the African continent to reflect on, primarily because as indigenous African peoples who have gone through colonization by European superpowers, which was occasioned by land dispossession, among many other evils, we identify with the struggles of the indigenous populations of Canada. The Syrian Communist Party. We take this opportunity to express our thanks to your fraternal party for its solidarity with the just struggle waged by our party with the rest of the Syrian people against the aggressive schemes of global imperialism and Zionism. Our people fight valiantly for the defense of national independence, full national sovereignty, and the preservation of unity of the national territory. United Syrian Communist Party. The Communist Party of Canada has an honorable history in the struggle for better future for all workers in Canada. Also, your long history in the struggle against American imperialism through your stand against the war on Vietnam and Korea, your distinguished contributions in the field of peace and socialism, and your party's demand for the withdrawal of the Israeli occupation forces and the preservation of the rights of the Palestinian Arab people to return their land and self-determination. We highly appreciate your party's support of our people against the war of aggression that has been waged against Syria for more than 10 years. Communist Party USA The Communist Party of the USA had its 100th founding anniversary in 2019, and both of our parties have fought for a century for a respective working class. Both of our parties are Marxist-Leninist internationalist parties that have faced the most reactionary opposition for most of our political life. Our comrade Winston once stated that being a communist is being consistent with our ideals, workers' rights, the struggle against racism and other forms of discrimination, and for peace and a socialist future. We both struggle against the capitalist class and have fought internal opportunists that want to derail our work. We both share a history of fight back for what we call the good fight. We now face a different world with a different balance of forces. Post-pandemic and in a new century of struggle, we have a tremendous opportunity for international collaboration against climate change, for peace and common prosperity. Neoliberal policies are on the ropes around the world. This is our century, and we recommit to the struggle for a socialist future. Communist Party of Venezuela it has been 100 years of fruitful battles proudly celebrated by Canadian workers and the Communist and Workers' Parties of the world. The Communist Party of Venezuela greets Canada's working people and communists on this anniversary of your party, and we pay tribute to the heroes, heroines, and martyrs who selflessly contributed their lives to writing the glorious pages of the history of the Communist Party of Canada. We would also like to express our deep gratitude for your ever firm and committed solidarity with the Venezuelan people who suffer the double onslaught of imperialist aggressions and policies which benefit private capital. Communist Party of Vietnam. Inspired by the Great October Revolution and the worldwide movements in the wake of the 20th century, throughout the 100 years of its establishment, the CPC has been restlessly struggling for Canadian people's and workers' rights. Your party's history is remarkable in the international communist movement. We always cherish the support of the CPC during our struggles for freedom and independence in the past, as well as the cause of national defense and construction at present. We strongly believe that the CPC will successfully uphold its traditions, strength and wisdom to inspire the Canadian people and workers to overcome the difficulties and make greater contributions to the communist and workers movement across the globe for peace, democracy, equality and social progress. Bien, extraordinaire, hein? Uh, inspirant, vraiment. Merci aux camarades qui ont fait uh, tous ces montages, uh, des salutations uh, de nos frères uh, communistes uh, de l'international. Bon, um, camarades, uh, eh, c'est temps-ci uh, que nous finissons à uh, la célébration uh, du centenaire uh, de notre glorieux Parti communiste canadien, euh, une partie de la classe révolutionnaire qui se bat pour le socialisme et plus essentiel, 
est plus essentiel que jamais, comme l'avait la, mentionné Lisboa euh, auparavant. Mais euh, au nom de, du Parti communiste du Canada, nous remercions à toutes et tous les camarades qui ont contribué à, à cet hommage, et les techniciens, les oratrices, les oratrices, les musiciennes, mille merci. Euh, et car Marx disait euh, une idée devient une force lorsqu'elle s'empare des masses. Alors, euh, vive les 100 ans du Parti communiste du Canada, vive l'internationalisme prolétarien, vive les communistes du monde entier, camarades. Hasta la victoria siempre venceremos. Euh, je ne sais pas si Dave voulait euh, euh, dire quelques mots aussi euh, pour la fin avant de conclure avec euh, notre chanson euh, fétiche, euh, l'internationale. La, la Merci Fabiola. Uh, thank you to everybody for celebrating with us today. It's such a special, uh, such a special celebration and a, and a wonderful and uplifting and inspiring time to be together. Um, Fabiola said some thank yous in French, so I will repeat some of them in English. Uh, thank you for the, to the technical group, uh, in particular Jay and Drew, for all your hard work. Um, we will also want to thank uh, the comrades who worked very hard on the documentary. And uh, for today, in particular, to Ryan, Kathleen, and Jeff, who prepared the, uh, the clip that we saw this, uh, this afternoon. And we're all looking forward to seeing the, the full film uh, later this month later next month uh, we want to thank all the speakers and the readers and the the performers it was just wonderful to have you here uh, thank you very much for for your contributions uh, and you should know that uh, there's been a whole committee of people working on the centenary of the party uh, for many months uh, this this celebration is one aspect of those um, of that work, but there's been many other aspects of that work and, and uh, we really appreciate all the efforts that uh, comrades have made over this year um, to, to do the research, to pull together um, uh, uh, materials and, and you know, physical elements of our history and to prepare uh, uh, the film, to prepare uh, this, uh, this event. It's, it's really been a collective effort and it's been just wonderful. Uh, finally, I want to thank, and we want to thank all of our party veterans, tous les militants et militantes qui ont donné leur vie, leur énergie uh, pendant nos cent ans. Without you, we would not have a party here. We, we wouldn't have uh, made the gains that we've won as a working class and as a communist movement and, and as people who struggle for socialism. And I think with that in mind, that's really what we're celebrating. And with that in mind, we'd like to invite everybody to sing the international. Thank you.